Hello, and welcome to Book Break for Greece Public Library. I'm Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here. I moderate our Pints and Prose book discussion group, and I am joined, as always, by my colleague, Claire. Hi, everybody. I'm Claire, and I moderate the Historical Fiction group on Facebook and also As the Page Turns book club. Excellent. Um, so I just wanted to make a quick note to um, all of our viewers today. We are working with a new sort of automatic transcription service to provide the closed captionings at the bottom of the screen. Um, so they may or may not be super accurate. We'll see, um, but please bear with us as we try to keep making our videos accessible to everyone. Um, so that's that. And today we are going to be doing a wrap up of our spring reading challenge. So. We have been talking at length about the Expand Your Reading Horizons challenge that the library has been running this spring. Um, the challenge ends at the end of this month, so at the end of May. So you have still some time to read a couple more books maybe or get the books that you've read logged. Um, but since this is our last book break in May, Claire and I thought that we would just sort of talk about some of the books that we read and our thoughts and the categories and how it went for us. I really like this challenge personally. Mm -hmm. um, it made me branch out a little bit and some of the categories were just fun, so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I confess that I was, uh, I did participate in the challenge. I participated. I forgot my <laughs> sheet here, <Stra. laughs> Oh no. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I actually used it more as sort of an excuse to go back through my like old TBR pile for a lot of things and kind of tried to pull some of those and get them off the list um, for the challenge. So yeah, slightly different ways to go about it. But yeah, it was fun. It was fun. Nothing so, like a good challenge. I know, just a little motivation. <laughs> Do you wanna start with a book, Claire? Oh, sure, I'm gonna jump right in. Okay. Um, the first category I'm going to talk about is a, read a book that was made into a movie or TV series, and mm -hmm. this is Nomadland. Um, the book is on high demand right now, so I couldn't get a copy of the book for you, um, by Jessica Bruder. And boy, did this scare the living daylights out of me. So <laughs> um, for those of you that are not familiar with the story, it, it goes from the beet fields of North Dakota to Amazon warehouses all over the, the West. And it's a new low cost labor pool in the United States that is mainly made up of transient older adults. Uh, the invisible casualties of the Great Recession started mm -hmm. this, this movement of, of the nomads where people just couldn't really afford to keep homes anymore. And they, they bought campers and trailers. Many of them collaborate in groups. And they go from place to place. They have meetups. Some of it sounded fun, but most of it was very disconcerting because, of course, there's worries about health care. Uh, teeth are a major status symbol if you have good teeth. They talk about going to the dentist in Mexico because it's so much cheaper. And I really got the feeling that this you know, who wants to be 70, 80 years old and working 12 hours a day in an Amazon warehouse? Because that's what's happening. Um, you know, people that have lost everything and their children are so highly leveraged with debt or maybe had a lot of the ones profiled in the book had medical problems mm -hmm. and were bankrupted by medical bills. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, their children weren't allowed to help, you know, couldn't weren't in a position to help them. So off they went in their little little trailers. <laughs> and uh, at the end of the book, Jessica gives the cold hard facts, which is the top 1% in America now make 81 times what those in the bottom half do. Uh, for 117 million Americans, uh, earnings haven't changed since the 1970s. And America, as we know it, is really gaining a new de facto caste system is really the premise in the book. Um, and according to an index, the United States is the most unequal society of all developed nations. Uh, so very sobering, very thought provoking, 
I definitely would like to see the movie after reading the book, but um, although I found a few bright spots with the socialization, I found this book a very scary harbinger of what it's going to be like to be old in America, particularly when you start looking ahead at a lot of the people that have student loan debt and can't afford a house and you just wonder where it's all going to end. So yeah, starting out a big old downer. Yay! <laughs> Yay! No man land. <laughs> um, have you seen the movie yet, Claire? I have not. I have okay. Not. It's supposed to be so good. I know. I think I haven't watched the Academy either. Award for Best Picture. I believe. Uh, maybe. I'm pretty sure Frances McDormand. A oh, one Best I'm... Actress. Yeah. Yeah. I think the director won too, because she was the yes. female director. Yeah. Yes. First Asian American woman and like second woman ever right. <laughs> to win an Academy Award for Best Director. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, if we're starting um, with the downers, I will <laughs> talk about my downer, <laughs> which I don't think I talked about on a previous episode. I don't think so. Um, or maybe I did. It's Evicted by Matthew Desmond. Do you remember oh, that's on my list tag? too. Yeah. Um, I don't think so you did. Okay, good. So this was my book for um, a nonfiction book about which you know nothing. Um, so Evicted, um, as the title would suggest, is about um, evictions and housing insecurity. Um, so the author, his background is in sociology. So he's like an academic. Um, and he spent about a year, maybe more, living in Milwaukee, that's where the book is set, um, in kind of low income you know, neighborhoods um, where housing insecurity is uh, very high. So he follows um, several landlords and he follows several different um, individuals and families during this time. Um, and really, really spent a lot of time with them and got to know them um, and is looking at um, the way that evictions, being evicted from your home um, can destabilize your entire life and your entire future. Um, so it's infuriating and heartbreaking. Um, and there are no real easy answers here. Like there's no one that is like a straight villain and no one that is a hundred percent a good guy. Like this is very much a book about shades of gray. Um, but it does talk about how um, people can be evicted for just about anything, mm -hmm. like for cause, without cause. Um, he talks about how there are some landlords, basically slumlords really, um, who are renting these apartments that are just not fit for human habitation. But if you, if the tenants call a building inspector um, to come and look at the place, essentially like it gets you branded as a troublemaker and you're gonna get evicted from the place that you <laughs> like is so terrible, you don't wanna be living there anyway. Um, so there are families that sort of bounce around from apartment to apartment, um, in and out of shelters, like emergency shelters. Um, there is um, like a trailer park that he follows a lot of the residents there um, and their issues. So there are issues with um, mental illness, there are issues with drug addiction, there are issues just with like the fact that if you are in and out of like eviction court, you're missing work. You're more likely to lose your job. Like looking for a new apartment takes so much time and energy and money. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times when folks get evicted, um, they'll have like a moving service come in and remove their belongings if the tenant doesn't do it on their own. Like the last day they'll come. And you get a choice of either your stuff goes on the curb or it goes into storage. And if it goes into storage, then you're essentially paying the storage fee. You're paying rent for your stuff while you're trying to find a place to live. Like it's just, 
it's a nightmare and it was very eye-opening about sort of the cyclical nature of it, that kind of housing instability and poverty. Um, there's one person that the author follows who ends up um, in a shelter where they have a program to like help you find secure housing mm -hmm. and make that transition. And the way that he is able to completely turn his life around because of that one piece, like that one piece of security, he's able to just rebuild basically his entire life from there. So it's really, really eye-opening, um, super distressing, um, but a really, really good book. Um, it doesn't feel like luxury. It you very much feel that the author has a lot of empathy for the folks that he's um, following and talking mm -hmm. about and dealing with. Um, so that one is Evicted by Matthew Desmond. Highly, highly recommend. Yeah, I highly recommend Nomadland too. And, and listening to you, I realize I forgot to say one quote that really yeah. struck me reading the book that also applies to your book. Mm -hmm. um, in America, if you don't have an address, you're not a real person. How do you get a credit mm -hmm. card? How do you get a bank account? Mm -hmm. How do you even get a library card without an address? Yeah. Um, so that that just is another factor that you don't really think about. So absolutely, absolutely. All right, got something a little more. Gonna bring it up. Thank Gonna bring yay. it up. <laughs> So my next book has Claire written all over it. Um, it's, doesn't this look like a young Claire? It's mm -hmm. called Of a Feather by Dana Lorenz. And this was my middle grade. Uh, we had a category for middle grade or teen fiction. And I loved this little book. It was about a, a young girl named Maureen um, who is facing a lot of heartaches. Her mom is struggling with mental illness. She's been living with grandma, but grandma kind of had a bad boyfriend. Uh, that had some anger issues. So they decided to move Maureen into another living arrangement with a great aunt that she had never met before. Mm -hmm. So she's very apprehensive, but when she goes and meets Aunt Beatrice, she is a master falconer, which she found really cool. Um, and the two find a great horned owlet that uh, mom was hit by a truck um, and decide to try to rehabilitate it because the rehabilitation office was full and they they decided to do it with like encouragement and help from that office. So Maureen starts going to a new school. She finally starts making friends. She is bonding with this owl and is absolutely drawn into the falconry and loves it, um, loves taking care of the birds um, and really begins to develop a relationship with her aunt and some stability in her life by actually having friends and a safe place to invite friends to like do group projects at school. Um, so although she misses her mom and she goes back and, you know, sees her, visits her mom, her mom is in a hospital right now. Um, it really, it really is touching to see how she can grow as a person. The funny thing is, is the comic relief in this book comes from the chapters written by the great horned owlet, uh, <laughs> whose name is Rufus. And Rufus feels like a really bad owl. Um, he feels a lot of guilt because his mom was valid, valiantly trying to teach him to hunt, you know, when she had her accident. And a little spoiler, she didn't die. So don't worry about that. Um, there is a happy reunion Yay. later in the book. Yay. But um, he is just so funny in the way he characterizes, uh, like Maureen, he calls her, I think, the fuzzy haired human, the, the, or the fuzzy haired thing is here, you know. Um, <laughs> but they're a very great pair, and they're both gaining confidence in their own way, um, him to eventually learn how to hunt and be successful on his own. And um, Maureen, with being able to accept new friends and accept, you know, really affection. Um, you know, and have a relationship with her aunt and her mom. And she grows to, in the end, when her mom is out of the hospital, to speak her mind and actually say what she would like for the first time. Like her mom wants to take her back to her old school, but she's like, you know, I really like my new school. 
and I like my new friends and seeing Aunt B. And so she, you know, they get an apartment and stuff in that town. And Aww. I felt really good for her and Rufus. There's a very funny scene at the end, you know, where, you know, Rufus says goodbye and finds his mom. So, yeah, good novel. Nice. A good um, Claire book or bird book. Yeah. No, that sounds really sweet. Yeah. Nice. Um, I also have uh, one for that same category, so middle grade or teen book, um, and I am about halfway through it right now, but that is Moxie by Jennifer Matthew. Um, so some of you may have seen, it's been made into a movie on Netflix starring mm -hmm. Amy Poehler. Um, so Moxie is about um, a high school girl in small town, Texas. Um, her mom was sort of a riot girl in the 90s, um, moved to Portland and was in like the punk scene and all of that and moved back home to Texas um, after, uh, so Vivian is our main character, moved back home after Vivian's father was killed in an accident. So she moved back um, kind of next door to her parents so that her parents could help her raise um, the baby. So um, Vivi is in high school and she's starting to notice uh, some um, disparities in her school with the way like the high school or football players are treated, the football team versus like the girls in the school. And she gets mad and she's trying to figure out what to do with her anger. And she ends up um, starting a zine anonymously called Moxie. And the great thing about reading this book as opposed to listening to it is that they actually give you like, like pictures you of the get scene. copies of the zine yeah. in the book, which is super cute. Um, and so it's, I, again, I'm only about halfway through. So she's starting to try and figure out a way to like make her voice heard and kind of fight back against these injustices that she's seeing. Um, so it's, it's very cute. Um, I am in between, I'm probably a little bit younger than the mom in the book. Um, and my kids are a little bit younger than Vivian, but I can sort of relate a little bit to that kind of late nineties aesthetic, which is fun. And then I also have the mom perspective. Um, my kids in middle school, but, um, it's interesting reading teen books that way as like the parent of a mm -hmm. young teenager. Yeah. Um, it's a, a totally different perspective, I think, than if I had read it when I was a teenager. So that, that sounds fun. like it would be a great mother daughter movie night too, you know, with yeah. Netflix and popcorn and absolutely, you know, yeah. Yeah. So that one's awesome. fun. All right. My next one is a graphic novel, which I typically mm. don't read a lot of graphic novels. I don't know why but we had a category that was not Marvel, DC, or Image. And I went with, um, this is the top shelf. It's called March, book one mm -hmm. by John Lewis. And this is the first in a series of three about, mm -hmm. it's a nonfiction one about John Lewis's lifelong struggle for civil and human rights. Um, so this one really is book one. It's when he's young, um, his life changing meeting with Martin Luther King and um, him starting his own sit-in movement at his school. And uh, it's funny because he and his the other students that were involved drew inspirations from a 1950s comic book, Martin Luther King Jr. and the, uh, and the Montgomery story had. And now his own comic is bringing, you know, that story and civil mm -hmm. rights to to a more modern age. So I definitely will read the other ones in the series. We have the whole series here at the mm -hmm. library. Um, and it's fun for people that like nonfiction that may not want to plow through a whole book, but just right. get, you know, the elements. But yeah, I thought that was, was a great choice. For nice. Very cool. Um, yeah, I haven't read that one. Um, my mom did, went through and read the whole thing. I don't remember whether that was for book club or just on her own. But. I think they won an award too. I can't. Yes. Think, yeah. 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 I don't remember which one, but um, yeah. So that could also work for um, 
award-winning book mm -hmm. from exactly. the 21st century. Nice. And if you're pressed for time. It's yeah, you can zoom through a graphic novel. Yeah, for sure. Nice. Um, okay, so I'm going to do, my next one is going to be the book that I read for, um, about a social issue. So mine is When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole, which is a thriller um, about gentrification. So it is set in a very rapidly gentrifying Brooklyn, um, modern day, um, and there are two point of view characters. Um, and of course it's been long enough that I have like completely forgotten everyone's names in the book. <laughs> I know. Um, so we have um, our main character is a black woman who grew up in Brooklyn. She's living in her um, mother's house, the house that she grew up in. Um, and then we have Theo is our other point of view character. Um, who is a white man who has moved into um, a brownstone across the street um, with his girlfriend. Um, so he is kind of one of the people actively gentrifying the neighborhood. Um, so it's, it's an interesting book because there's a lot of history of um, sort of the different demographic shifts in Brooklyn over time, like from the Dutch all the way up to the present day. Oh, wow. Um, and sort of some looks at, um, you know, there are a lot of parallels between sort of the, the Dutch coming over and colonizing and pushing out the original Native American population to um, sort of the white, uh, wealthy, young folks coming in and gentrifying and pushing out the older, um, Black and Latino population from the area. Um, so, and kind of how all of this tends to be cyclical. Um, so that's interesting. And then there's also this like kind of bonkers thriller on top of it all. So you've got like actual historical facts and then that's the platform for, um, yeah, just this kind of pot boiling thriller on top. So it's like everything just gets kind of played up um, for effect. Um, a lot of folks have made parallels between the book and Get Out, which I think um, the movie, which I think tonally is right. Um, so if you liked the movie Get Out, um, this, is, this is a great read and you learned some history. So I've had that one on my list. I, mm -hmm. It's gone. I've I've actually put it on hold and given it several trips home. So maybe, mm -hmm. maybe I will eventually get to that one. Yeah, it's the, the kind of like bonkers part is maybe the last like third of the book. Like there's kind of a slow build and then all of a sudden you're like, all right, we got to the top of the roller coaster and now we're riding <laughs> and it's whoo, right until the end. Isn't Alyssa Cole also an author of color? So you she could is, use yes. that for author of color as mm -hmm. well. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Um, my next book is book about a refugee. Um, mm. You know, all those contests that I you enter sometimes on either Goodreads or the, the book. Mm -hmm. I actually won one. So I won a bunch of copies for my book club. It, it was a pre-pub called Of Women in Salt by Gabriel Garcia. And um, this one was like you, I read it a while ago. But it's a tale, it's a generational tale. It's actually a very short book, which mm -hmm. kind of surprises me because it travels over a lot of time. Like it's, it's barely 200 pages. Um, so you're going from Cuba to Miami and you start out with this, this family with literally a cigar roller Cuban woman in um, her marriage, you know, some of the horrible things that happened there to a modern day descendant that's in Miami that is struggling with um, drug addiction, her heritage. And she also has uh, a woman and her daughter that live next door that are El Salvadoran refugees. So there's kind of like two threads of, of immigration in this book. Um, and of course, what happens, uh, the, the El Salvadoran, the mother is seized and the young daughter 
is not there at the time. So she comes to stay and that's how the two families get together and then what happens to them. So it's um, a pretty sad story. The, my only complaint with it was it was hard for me like the author flashes back and forth. Mm. So you're you're going back and forth and there's many characters in the, the lineage and it's like, okay, I, I need like a family tree here. And did we miss <laughs> Cecilia? You know, because I don't remember reading her story, but yet she's part of the, the family. So that, that made it a little difficult, but there's been a lot of buzz about that book. Mm -hmm. um, and I still think it would be a good book club um, just because of the immigration and you know me, I love a good mm -hmm. family drama because Absolutely. what family doesn't have drama. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. that was, that nice. was my immigration story. Yeah. In fact, um, Roxanne Gay just started an online book club and that is her first book Oh, for her book club. So yeah. So qualifies for a celebrity book club. True. <laughs> Absolutely category. true. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, cool. So my next one is another one that I'm like in, in process with, it is a current read. I'm trying to get a couple wrapped up before the end of the month. Um, but it is my book for, um, a work in translation, which is my brilliant friend by Elena Ferrante. Um, and this one has been on my list for ever and ever and ever, um, everyone has like just wonderful things to say about it. Um, it would also work for first book in a series. It is the first one in a series of four books, um, the Neapol book one of the Neapolitan novels. Um, so this one is um, like a coming of age story. Mm -hmm. So our main character is Elena. Um, Elena Ferrante is a pen name um, I believe she was actually outed like within the last year or so, but she published under a pen name and was always like incredibly secretive about her true identity. Um, so the main character is Elena um, and it's a story of her growing up um, with her best friend Lilu in Naples. Um, so the story starts in kind of the late 50s and we're working up into the 60s um, but it starts when they're like six years old and making friends in elementary school um, and these two girls so they live in kind of a rough neighborhood in Naples um, a lot of it is just sort of like around the edges but I don't know if you're familiar with um, the Camorra which is like the, the huge uh, crime family in Italy. Okay. Um, just like they're essentially the Italian mob. Um, and so there's like Camorra around the edges. And as they get older, they start to like kind of learn more about sort of the, the politics of their area. Um, but there is just a lot of poverty and violence just in sort of the course of daily life. Um, but Elena and Lilu um, become friends when they're small and really um, push each other um, to learn and grow. Um, they push each other in school. Uh, Lilu is, um, she is the brilliant friend <laughs> of the title. She's super smart. Um, and kind of pushes Elena to um, do better in school and better herself and continue her schooling. Um, and I'm at the point where they are teenagers and starting to like gain some independence and figure out what they're gonna do, kind of the trajectory that their lives are going to take um, and how they can navigate the waters of like the organized crime and um, like the not so nice people in their neighborhood. Um, so it's interesting. I, I'm not sure I love it as wholeheartedly as many of the reviews led me to believe that I would. <laughs> um, but it's interesting and we'll see, we'll see where it goes to the end. Um, but you definitely get a sense of like the grittier side of Italy in um, kind of mid-century. 
not the tourist destinations. So. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> My last one is also a book that was translated. Um, it was originally in Danish called The Tenant by Katrine Engberg. And this one was a mystery and it was interesting. I, you know, I like mysteries and I particularly like these darker Scandinavian type mm -hmm. mysteries in the winter. Um, so it was a kind of a complicated and a compelling case because there was um, a very flawed lead detective who is reeling from a divorce. He's got a little painkiller problem. Um, his partner is female, happily married, and very irritated when he leaves her out of the action and kind of goes on his own for this investigation. Um, there was a a brutal murder that's in an apartment house of um, there were two young girls that were living in an apartment and then an older kind of author who had almost like what I would call a salon and people would come and visit and exchange thoughts and arty things and blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, this woman was writing a mystery crime novel and the murder is kind of duplicates that. Mm. So initially she's implicated in the crime, but, um, they can't actually believe that this older woman would have pulled this off. It obviously looks like a man, um, but then they're trying to figure out the lines of people that have visited the, the lives of the, the two girls, um, particularly the one that was killed and what might have happened. Um, so yeah, it was very interesting and it ends up these characters are going to be continued in another book and it might already be out. Um, I definitely would read the second book in the series. So this could be your first book in the series or nice. it could be, you know, your, your translation book because it was Danish, but there's a lot of different suspects. Um, it was fun. It was, uh, you know, it, it wasn't the person that they originally point to. So you really have to pay attention. Nice. Yeah. That one's been on my list for a little while. Yeah. So, all right. All right. Nice. Um, my last one is my uh, classic of genre fiction. So I went with science fiction and my book was Dune by Frank Herbert. Um, so I read this book for the first time in like seventh grade. Um, and I think I've read it again at least once as an adult, um, but it's been years and years. Um, and there is a new movie coming out. So this would also work for uh, film adaptation um, or first in series. Um, so I wanted to reread it and refresh myself before the, the movie comes out. Um, and it just goes to show you that the reading experience of it this time was so different from what I remember in the past. Like I remembered a lot more um, like action in the book and really there's a lot of like politics in this book and like machinations um kind of along the lines of like a game of thrones where everyone's sort of angling for power um but also set in space on a desert planet um uh, called dune um so it's it was it was a really interesting experience to reread it. Um, I don't know that I'm going to go back and reread any of the other books in the series, um, of which there are quite a few. So Frank Herbert himself wrote, I think, six, and then his son took over and has written a whole bunch of additional books all set in this same universe. Um, but our main character is Paul Atreides. He is the son of a duke. Um, and the Duke has just been granted sort of the, the fiefdom of this planet Arrakis, which is also known as Dune, this desert planet. Um, and Dune's main claim to fame is that um, they mine spice there. So it's this um, substance kind of like cinnamon that they mine from the desert and it has um, life prolonging effects um, and also some if you take it in sufficient quantities some psychotropic effects um, 
but it is incredibly expensive because it only comes from this one place and it's dangerous to mine it. Um, so kind of being in charge of this planet is both um, very lucrative, but also puts you in kind of a dangerous position because everybody else wants to be there too and wants to be in control. So it's kind of um, a coming of age of Paul, of the Duke's son. Um, there's, I mean, just fascinating world building. Um, so there are like these desert people who um, no one knows that much about their culture, but on reread, I don't know how much I picked up of this before, they are essentially modeled on like the um, Arabs of our world, um, which, you know, many planets later, they get back to the desert. I don't know quite how that works, but here we are. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, the world building is fascinating and the like political intrigue is interesting. There's just a lot more of it than I remembered in between sort of bouts of action. Um, but it is absolutely a classic of science fiction. Um, and if you are planning on watching the movie that's coming out in the fall, um, which I will be, not a bad idea to pick that one back up and reread it. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, my daughter is going through that series now. Mm. Be on three. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I made it past three ever. Um, but, you know, teach their own. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So we would love to hear from you all about um, what books you read, if there was something that surprised you, if there's something you were particularly glad that you read um, that you maybe wouldn't have picked up without the challenge, um, or if you have any suggestions for folks who are trying to get maybe one or two more books in for um, good picks for different categories. Um, I mean, there's a lot here that we did not cover today. <laughs> yeah. Um, so please drop some suggestions in the comments for your fellow readers. Um, do you have anything else? I think that was it. Like okay. I said, I just enjoyed it. I think I finished with about 20 and I doubt I'm going to get any more. Mm -hmm. You know, nice. I just ran into some roadblocks and mm -hmm. out of time and yeah, weather's too nice. So true makes it harder. <laughs> yeah. But I did read a lot this winter and this definitely mm -hmm. helped me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Claire. And for both of us here at Book Break, uh, happy reading and let us know um, how you're doing with the challenge. And we will be back in early June. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye.